My name is Siva Yam. I'm the president of the U.S. China Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the U.S. China Chamber of Commerce, the Japan American Society in Chicago, I would like to welcome you to the first ever U.S. China Japan Automotive Conference. A couple of weeks ago, I received a lot of phone calls. People asked me, given the state of the economy, which is very challenging, is the conference going to be on? I told them absolutely the conference will be on. If we play American football under all circumstances except lightning, why won't we do the conference? That is the attitude that makes United States, China, Japan so special. The three countries together, they have accounts for almost half of the world economy. It's the attitude that, will, that we will overcome all challenges that make it special. I've been very fortunate to be the president of the U.S. China Chamber of Commerce for almost 10 years. Along the line, I make a lot of friends, I meet a lot of people. One thing that I have learned, just like the Beijing Olympic, is one world, one dream. We all together, it doesn't matter whether we are Chinese, Japanese, American, you name it, we all share one thing in common, is to work together to make the world a better place to live. So given the fact that the automotive industry is under a very challenging situation, this conference is very timely because it gives us an opportunity to sit down, to evaluate all the options, and to work together to make this industry come back again and make, and make this economy going again. So I think this conference is very, very important, very timely. So I would like to compliment all of you for taking this initiative to come here to sit down so that we can make the world a better place to live. So I, and I would like to show a deep appreciation. We have, and I have two other co-chairs. While few of us are getting the limelight, there are some people that I would like to show a deep appreciation. It's Mr. Kohi Kawashima. Uh, and also my, uh, both of them, they work behind the scenes to make this event happen. And all the staff at the uh, America Japan Society in Chicago, they have put a lot of effort. And also my staff, uh, Juliana Sija, Ken, John Clark, they have all worked very hard to make this event happen. So let's give them a big applause for their effort. <laughs> well, I will turn over the floor to our two co-chairs to run the meeting to introduce some of the people. I would like to show my deep appreciation to our friend who came all the way from China. From Dalian, the mayor of Dalian, Shadon, have been a good friend. When he heard that we are going to do a conference, he immediately sent the uh, same fee delegation. May I ask the uh, Assistant Vice Mayor, the Honorable Zhang Zhao, to rise? Uh, <laughs> I hope you will take the opportunity to meet with him and meet some other delegations because they are the people that you can do a lot of business with. And China automotive industry has grown at the compound annual rate of 22%, even in the last few years. Just in last month, China recorded one of the largest trade surplus, and the foreign reserve is approaching two trillion US dollars. So I hope you will take the opportunity to do that. And I would also like to introduce the vice chairman of Brilliance Auto, the fifth largest car company in China, the Honorable Ho Gu Wa. <laughs> and also the, from the Dalian Free Trade Zone, the Honorable Lu, Lu Ling. <laughs> also from Changzhou, representing the mayor, uh, Teddy Lee. Teddy? <laughs> Also, the Honorable Pan Bao Jia, Vice Chairman of the Shanghai International Global Sourcing uh, Fair. <laughs> and also, the, um, uh, Mr. Zhao Jin Fa, he is the chairman of a logistics company. He had just invested uh, 6.5 billion RMB equal to $900 million in Hangzhou. He also developed another park in uh, Chengdu, 2.5 billion RMB, which is about 3 uh, 350 million US dollars. He is coming to America to invest, so if you need money, talk to him. <laughs> 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 
So, uh, and, uh, and I want to mention that uh, the Honorable Ho Fut Wa, Vice Chairman of Brilliant Auto, he had to leave tonight to go to uh, Houston uh, because uh, Houston Rocket had invested $100 million in his company. And he is going to play basketball with Yao Ming. He's going to be the center. He's going to dunk the ball over Yao Ming tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> now I would like to turn over uh, the floor to my two co-chair, Dennis Connell, and, uh, uh, and also the chairman from uh, Japan American Society. <clears throat> Thank you, Siva. Uh, honored guests, distinguished speakers, on behalf of the Japan America Society of Chicago, it is my honor and pleasure to add my welcome to you to this most interesting conference today. The purpose of the Japan America Society is to further friendship and understanding between Japan and the United States. Today's event, examining the roles among China, Japan, and the United States play, playing in the future of the global automotive industry is an excellent example of how well-developed trade and commerce relationships benefit specific industries and all of us. We are all feeling the current period of economic and market tumult. The auto industry appears to be a leading indicator of the rough tumble that we seem to be in for. There is no better time to analyze this great global industry to try to understand how best to pursue opportunities that this period presents. We have an outstanding lineup of presenters and speakers today and a great group of participants. In completing my welcome, I'd like to thank our sponsors and to wish all participants a highly productive and valued day today. Thank you very much. <laughs> And thank you very much, Ed. I would also like to uh, take this opportunity to thank our corporate sponsor, Navy Star. Um, they have been a member for the U.S. China Chamber of Commerce for many years, and uh, uh, we are very grateful that they have been a good supporter. Wanshan, Wanshan is the largest auto parts company in China. They have been in America for over 10 years. Pini is going to make a presentation. Pin also is a director of the U.S. China Chamber of Commerce. Also, Briggs and Stratton, uh, Ed Water, have been a long-time friend. Uh, we really appreciate your friendship. Uh, also, our new friend, Mesuda Funai, uh, they have been a very good friend of the uh, Japan American Society and U.S. China Chamber of Commerce member for many years. Without their support, this event would not be a reality, so we would like to show our Deep appreciation to all those sponsors. <laughs> also, we are very fortunate that we have been a partner with China Daily. If you travel to China, China Daily is the only official English newspaper in China. They've been our partner. They come here to cover the event. Uh, they also is our media sponsor. Also, manufacturing news. Um, and Mr. Howard Dubin has been a long-time fan of almost 10 years. Uh, it's him who give us the database that we are able to reach out to the community to help those people who are looking for information and who are want to participate in the event. Also, the Chicago uh, Shimo, uh, which is the uh, local Japanese newspaper, uh, and they have been a good friends, and uh, we appreciate that. And there was uh, some other people that, uh, and the list is long, so I'm not going to uh, to uh, list them all. And but. Uh, is our deep uh, uh, appreciation. Uh, I would like to show my deep uh, obligation to all of them. Now, I would like to introduce our good friend, uh, Dennis Cornell. He, he was the senior advisor. He is the senior advisor to Toyota. He was the senior VP of Toyota America. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dennis. <laughs> You know, 14 years ago, I uh, visited China for the first time. I was part of a panel that MIT had put together to talk to the Chinese auto industry. And I remember at that time, as we were speaking, um, that I thought, you know, the Chinese auto industry was about to take off. At that time, you are producing about a million vehicles. But none of us at that time could have predicted or forecast what has happened in those past 14 years. And I think that the development of the auto industry in China has been called maybe the most important development in the auto industry since Henry Ford invented the assembly line. 
So I think this conference is timely, and I look forward to hearing all the speakers, and I thank you all for attending. Uh, I think we're going to get right into our conference presenters, and, and I think we're uh, starting off with a, a great leadoff hitter with Steve Sturm from Toyota, Vice President for Strategic Research and Planning and Corporate Communications for Toyota Motor North America. Uh, I cannot think of a more perfect individual to uh, set the agenda for the day than Steve Sturm uh, from his position with Toyota and his strategic uh, research for this North American market. Please join me in welcoming Steve Sturm. Good morning. Give us a second to get technology to catch up with me. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today. And uh, this is certainly an interesting time to speak about Toyota's experience in the United States. We're all very much aware of the economic difficulties in the U.S. and throughout the global economy. And the auto industry, like most others, is facing some real challenges today. We're seeing an industry sales at their lowest level since the early 1990s. Customers are pulling big, off big purchases until uncertainty fades away. <clears throat> but despite the gloomy news, we do believe the U.S. auto industry will get past this rough patch. This morning, I'll discuss why we feel that way. I'll also share Toyota's perspective on the future of this market and the opportunities and how we intend to approach them. But first, it's important to understand why a healthy U.S. auto industry is so important. Throughout history, every leading developed country in the world grew under the wings of mighty in industries, with the auto industry leading the way. That's why today countries like China, Russia, and India are investing heavily in their developed auto nations. Not only is the auto industry an essential economic engine that provides mobility and creates long-term prosperity, but it's also a massive contributor to the economy. For instance, it's the country's largest manufacturing industry responsible for one out of every 10 U.S. jobs. It provides jobs in every state of the Union. It generates 4% of the nation's GDP. The auto industry pr uh, produces a high level of output in the, in the U.S. other than any other industry, 73% of the growth from 1990 to 2003 and spends more than any other in R&D, $15.2 billion. The U.S. automakers are among the largest purchases of aluminum, copper, iron, lead, plastics, rubber, textiles, vinyl, steel, and computer chips. And my favorite, half of the top 10 companies in, auto, in Fortune 500 and the Global 500 are either automakers or support this industry. That said, we are confident that a brighter future is ahead of, for our industry. The best way to describe our future is optimistic, but at the same time, we are realistic. We're all hoping for recovery that would look like a V, measure, meaning the market, will go, market has gone down and will re rebound fairly quickly. But instead, we think the recovery would be more like the Nike swoosh. Uh, gently going, going down quickly, but recovering more slowly, with some recovery in 2009 and steady progress in 2010, as the economic fundamentals recover solid footing. Here's why we think the industry's long-term outlook is looking up. For the U.S. population growth in the best developed world, and we are, we are the best developed world's population growth for some time. America has recently passed the 300 million mark, and we're adding more than 32 million people for the next 10 years. It's like adding Florida, New Jersey, and Maryland combined. And people are living longer. CNW research found that more than half of the 13 cars that an average American buys 
in their lifetime is purchased after the year of their age 50. Generation X is maturing and adding cars to their households. They buy more than a fifth of all new cars and will need more than any other vehicle sold. Generation X is maturing and adding cars to their household, but 4 million Generation Y, those born between 1980 and 1994, are reaching the driving age each and every year. Not to mention 4 million members of Generation Y born between 1980 and 94 will be reaching driving age each year. They are the second largest generation of all time and will be flexing their spending muscles in the year 2010, buying one in every four cars. By, by 2011, they'll be serving five generations at once. At this growth, plus a stronger U.S. economy will drive us to a new heights in productivity and sales. Before I discuss how Toyota is planning the future, let me give you some background on our operations. We today employ over 300,000 people and operations around the world. We sell to vehicles in over 170 countries, and last year we sold 9.3 million vehicles globally. We've come a long way in the U.S., where we've begun operations just 50 years ago. Last year, we had our 12th consecutive year of record sales, selling 2.6 million vehicles in the U.S., and today we're recognized as one of the most respected companies, but we're not standing still. We're positioned to continued growth in the U.S. as the market rebounds in the year 2010. We're optimistic because we're continuing to see growth of purchase considerations for the Toyota brands. We have fresh products in several of automotive, automotive markets' sweet spots, and we're stressing consumer loyalty, retention, advocacy in every market segment we participate in. We're also focusing on Toyota's reputation for QDR, quality, dependability, and reliability, as well as our leadership in fuel economy and environmental technology. And we're continuing to invest in North America. That's because we believe that in every market, whether it's China or the U.S., localization is best, not just for our customers, but for the communities where we do business. Toyota has over 30 facilities located across North America, and we employ more than 43,000 Americans. And our investment in North America totals $21.5 billion. We've just opened our new $187 million engineering and safety test facility in York Township, Michigan. Early this year, we announced plans to establish the Toyota Research Institute in North America. We plan to spend $100 million during the next four years for advanced research on engineering, safety, environmental solutions, and mobility infrastructure. And we have two new plants under construction. Our second Canadian plant in Woodstock, Ontario, will open next month, where we will build the RAV4. And as I mentioned, we're building the Prius at our new Mississippi plant beginning in 2010 at an investment of $1.3 billion. So we're truly committed to this market for the long term. Back to our investments and great vehicle lineup, we have tremendous hardworking associates and a very strong dealer network. Toyota and Lexus dealers lead, lead in sales per outlet and are among the most profitable in the industry. That's very important because at the time when some automakers are cutting dealers, ours are investing in better facilities better training to improve customer care and build brand loyalty for future sales. Specifically, Toyota and Lexus dealers are collectively investing $3 billion of their own money during the next two years to expand and improve their dealerships and their service. And that's in addition to the three plus billion dollars they've already invested over the past three years. With regards to products and looking ahead, we see growth opportunities in several areas. These include youth, trucks, affluent customer, consumers, and hybrids. Today I'll talk about two of these markets, the youth and hybrids. Let's take a look at the youth market. It's 62 million drivers under the age of 35 years old. It's hard to believe, but this month marks our fifth anniversary of Scion, which is targeted right at the youth market. 
It's been a great five years, and Scion continues to be a vital part of our business and our future. During this time, Scion has successfully served as a laboratory for experimentation and is attracting a new customer to a Toyota and will serve as a foundation for our future growth. That's important since there are four million Generation Y consumers reaching the driving age each and every year. By the year 2010, there will be 20 million Generation Y drivers, and Scion will be helping capture many of, the, many of these to our franchise. In fact, 72% of Scion owners are first-time owners to the Toyota franchise. Scion is also strong, acting as a strong outflow to the Toyota brand. More than 8 out of 10 replacement vehicles for Scion so far have been trading up for Toyota vehicles. As the median age of Scion drivers is 33 years old, our non-traditional grassroots marketing is definitely working to reach this target audience. Scion is more than a brand, it's a community where consumers have a big say in the direction of the brand. Now along with Scion, we're focusing on more mainstream Toyota vehicles for youth as well. Our all new Corolla and Matrix, which are made in North America, are sportier than ever and offer performance models. In, ad in addition, the Tacoma is still highly popular with young buyers and Yaris continues to attract young first time owners. Then there is the story of our hybrids. You may not remember, but Toyota began selling hybrids eight years ago with the Prius, when gas was a dollar a gallon. Some of our competition scoffed at the notion then, and that's not the case as you know anymore. Today, Toyota has sold over 1.5 million hybrid vehicles worldwide. In the US, we've sold 277,000 hybrids last year alone, more than all the other automakers combined. And the Prius is now the third best-selling car in America and one of the 10 best-selling cars in the nation. Globally, we estimate Prius sales combined have saved over 452 million gallons of gasoline and have kept more than 4.5 million pound tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Today, we offer six hybrid models in the U.S. 12% of U.S. sales are hybrids, and we've sold over 80% of all hybrids in America. At next year's Detroit Auto Show, we'll stage the world premiere of two new dedicated hybrids, the third generation Prius and an all new Lexus hybrid. In addition, by 2009, Toyota will deliver a significant fleet of plug-in hybrid vehicles powered by lithium ion batteries to a wide variety of global commercial customers with many coming to the US. Hybrids will remain the core technology for all our future powertrains, but they are just the beginning. We have some very aggressive R&D efforts underway. Toyota, on average, will spend, is spending nearly $1 million an hour on research and development to bring the world's cars that are better, cleaner, safer, and more fun to drive. We're developing several promising technologies that deliver high-end fuel economy and lower emissions, including expanding production of our hybrid batteries and reducing their costs, and accelerating R&D of our small electric vehicles and fuel cells. Another trend that we're seeing in this market is, and we cannot ignore, is that of corporate social responsibility. While it has always been a priority for us, to be honest, we were surprised on how far the needle has moved ahead over the years. Consumers are demanding a new approach from companies in general. They are demanding that companies do the right thing by society. They want automakers to focus on the environment and reduce their environmental footprint. Hybrids and alternative technology vehicles are a nice start, but consumers also want to know that companies have responsible business practices. So we're constantly working to reduce our vehicle's impact across the entire life cycle. This includes everything from design and engineering, to manufacturing, to energy usage, and disposal. For example, at our manufacturing plants, we're not just focusing on building quality vehicles using the most eco-friendly methods and materials, but also producing as little waste as possible from the plants themselves. 
Our U.S. plants have achieved zero landfill status, which means no waste goes into landfills. We accomplish this by reducing energy consumption, raw material usage, and, re and recycling virtually every material in the plant. We even compost food from our cafeterias. Our new Mississippi plant is a great example of our vision of a sustainable plant. It will feature renewable energy and improving recycled methods. It will also be surrounded by a new 100-acre nature preserve. We also support organizations that promote environmental education and conservation. We recently partnered with the National Audubon Society to launch Together Green, a multi-million dollar program which funds conservation projects, environmental education, and other volunteer opportunities across the U.S. We also have a long-term relationship with the National Arbor Day Foundation and the National Parks Foundation to support their initiatives, just to name a few. Because CSR is such a high priority, we have placed a renewable emphasis on telling our story through corporate advertising. One of the most recent campaigns illustrates how Toyota constantly challenges itself by asking tough questions and asking why not in everything that we do. For example, can you make an impact by making none at all? Why not? The ad provides examples of Toyota's commitment to sustainability in everything that we do. Campaigns like Why Not will increasingly play a role in our overall marketing efforts in the years to come. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in a very short time this morning, so let me summarize my key points. Despite the difficulties we face this year, we're optimistic about the long-term future of the, auto make, of the auto market. Why? Because the demographics that drive our business so strongly favor its health and growth. We're redoubling our emphasis on quality. We're improving our retail customer experience. We're also leveraging industry-leading brand loyalty. We're working on new ways to attract young buyers and buyers to our brands. And we're planting, planning our future with some great new products. And at the same time, we're continuing to focus on the environment and on CSR. We firmly believe when the market rebounds, we'll have the right products, the right strategies, and the right people to continue strong growth in North America. Thank you very much for your interest. Steve, thank you for those great comments. Uh, that's, that's a great way to start off our program with a, a very nice overview from Toyota North America. And I think as, as a response to that, uh, coming with Daryl Hazel, uh, Senior Vice President of Ford Motor and President of Ford Customer Service Division, uh, should give us a, a great overview for a North American automobile company and some of the changes that they have in the works there and, and plans that uh, we can expect in the near future. So please join me in welcoming Daryl Hazel from Ford North America. Good morning, everyone. I, uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here and to represent Ford. Uh, I thought that I would speak this morning on uh, the way we see the market unfolding, uh, our response to it, and specifically our, our interests and activities in uh, China. We, uh, as well as anyone who is looking and 
observing the world as it unfolds, recognizes that change is really afoot. So give me a little history about Ford, not a lot, because uh, uh, we've been around for 105 years. Um, to sustain yourself over 105 years, you have to be somewhat nimble, although I think that that's a trait that for a while we lost our way, but we're headed back in that direction. And as the slide says, we are one of the few companies to survive for that long. Um, part of the evolution of Ford has been uh, certainly that we do have a global presence, but it's only recently that we've started to move in the direction of becoming a unified global company. We had a lot of separate organizations around the world, and in simple, straightforward optimization theory, we optimize the parts, which, as those of you who study that would know, means you do not optimize the whole. So we are now moving toward, in part because it's an economic necessity, but it's also the smart thing to do we're moving toward optimizing the whole. We're, le we're leveraging the power of all our different businesses, and we're working on finding the best parts and vehicle solutions throughout the world. That technology up here is sort of interesting. <laughs> yeah, I see that, but it's, it, uh, you get to cover the screen at the same time. Oh. Yeah, fine. One of the other things that you certainly are seeing as the world changes is that uh, Communication is such that there are no secrets. Things that are good, things that are bad, certainly uh, uh, are instantaneous in their communication. And this too augurs for why you want to have as global and interdependent an organization as possible. The consumer is becoming smarter than ever through this communication change. And to respond to that, it's absolutely essential that you do provide the best products around the globe. If you have a standard brand name and it has a problem in the Middle East, it becomes your problem in North America or Asia as well. So whether it's lighter weight, more fuel efficient, uh, uh, responsibility, as Toyota spoke about, for environmental issues, safe working conditions, all these things around the globe matter to everybody because as the conference started out by saying, part of the purpose of being in business is to better everyone's existence, not just the business organization. So in China today, we compete and are really developing some of the best products that we have around the world for your emerging consumer. And it is that emerging consumer that is helping China continue to grow and increase its influence on the world stage and in the world economy. So <clears throat> while we were late to China, in some sense, we have tried to move quickly. And yes, uh, we do try to make every day exciting, which is uh, Ford's tagline in China. We have a great dealer network. 
And as is often said, a picture is, in fact, worth a thousand words. We also have great dealers and their commitment to providing outstanding service to their customers is in part evidenced by this very contemporary modern facility. And uh, my, my experts tell me that the pylon says drive the Ford Fiesta and go World Cup in the Paris final. So marketing makes a, uh, an appearance globally. So in China today, we do provide state-of-the-art technology and car designs. Uh, the Nanjing assembly plant contains both advanced Ford and Mazda technology. The Nanjing engine plant, clearly state-of-the-art. And the Changjin assembly plant is uh, something anybody would proud, be proud to be associated with. Uh, we are effectively positioning ourselves to compete in both passenger vehicles and the commercial vehicle market. Clearly, both are required for continued growth. We also have a research and engineering center in Nanjing. So, it's a dynamic, evolving process. We have provided uh, our best to China, and we uh, very much desire to continue to improve in developing a reciprocal relationship. And together we will make One Ford a powerful reality on the global stage. Uh, part of the evidence of our commitment is uh, I asked our senior director of parts procurement, Randy Creel, to come over and participate in this conference. And uh, Randy's out there. Would you just stand up and say hello to everyone? <laughs> Randy has lived in China since 2005. <clears throat> I believe some of you know him, and he's certainly interested in getting to know more of you. We are uh, actively working at improving our parts business uh, with you, both for your internal consumption and for export. Uh, as you saw in the beginning, I am in the parts and service division, and believe me, we take parts very seriously. And they are the foundation of providing uh, the ongoing satisfaction and uh, maintaining a successful experience with anyone's vehicle. So in summary, I'd just like to say Ford does want to do more business with China and in China. And our uh, commitment is real and sustainable. So I don't know uh, whether there are people who uh, might have questions. And uh, as I said, Randy will be here for the entire conference. I'll be here for a good part of the morning. But uh, we appreciate the opportunity to address the group. And we look forward to the opportunity of getting to know some of you during our uh, breaks. So, thoughts, questions, or? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Devo. Uh, do we have any question from the floor? 
If not, I'm going to let the um, devil get off the uh, podium. On behalf of the U.S. China Chamber of Commerce, Japan America Society in Chicago, and all our corporate sponsors, we would like to show our appreciation to Ford Motor, particularly Daryl, came all the way. And we are trying to balance the trade with China, so all the coffee mug make, is made in America, proudly made in America. So I would like to uh, present Daryl one. Thank you very much. Thank you. We also have another uh, loose side, but because due to quality problem, we send it back to the manufacturer. They are making it. They will be delivered later. And we would like to present to our speakers. So, um, and I would uh, thank all the speakers for their patience. Um, I want to uh, mention a few things. Uh, you have the earphone. Uh, we have only one channel. If the speaker speak in English, the uh, sound will come out in Chinese. If the speaker speak in Chinese, it will come out in English. So make it very simple. Uh, one of the purpose of this conference is for people to know each other so we can work uh, together. Uh, I, I strongly recommend you to go for the attending this. Go over it, see which company that you would like to meet. If any company that you like to meet, either American company, Japanese company, or Chinese company, and we do have a large number of Japanese automotive parts company at this conference, so I urge you to take advantage of this opportunity to meet with them. Um, and you can go to our front desk, talk to our staff, tell them which person that you want to meet. We will try our best to locate the person and set up the meeting for you. So I encourage you to do that. Ford Motor have a uh, big operation in Nanjing, and I was in Nanjing four weeks ago, and the mayor has sent a delegation come to this conference. Unfortunately, they won't arrive until tomorrow, 8 o'clock in the morning. They will be at my office at 10 o'clock. If you want to meet any people from Nanjing, call me and I'd be happy to set up the meeting for you. Nanjing have, uh, I believe, five or seven car factories. They have 20, uh, 12 or 20 uh, specialty vehicle factory. So, and along with Dalin, Shenyan, Shanghai, Changzhou, uh, Nanjing is also one of the cities that, uh, uh, and I think you should consider that. We would plan on taking some delegation to China next year. We are going to visit some of the uh, cities that uh, are here and some cities that are not here today. And I really thank uh, the mayor of uh, Thailand and uh, have been a long time friend. So, uh, I, uh, once again, uh, and we also have food outside. So, and if you want to get something to eat, just feel free to do that. And we make it very informal, so give us more chance to know each other. Now, I would like to introduce the next speaker, but uh, just give me one minute and let me get my notes. Uh, Tom uh, has been a speaker at our first U.S.-China Automotive Conference in Detroit about three years ago. He is a senior economist in the e Economic Research Department at the Federal Research Bank of Chicago. Federal Research Bank of Chicago has been working with the U.S.-China Chamber of Commerce to help various businesses to understand the, uh, the dynamics uh, to a possible in the uh, uh, global economy. Dr. Clear Reserve focus uh, recently on the auto industry, including the changing structure of the auto industry and the responsiveness of the demand for new vehicle to the price of gasoline. <coughs> I'm sorry. Maybe I, and I need to ask them to help. Um, in Dr. Clear, research has been widely published in a lot of journals, including the Journal of Regional Study, Journal of Business and, and, and Economic Statistics. Thank you very much. You are a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you. <laughs> if you see an MBA from a university in Germany, and I don't speak German, I, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name, but you can check the book and you can see which 
German university that he graduated from, and you can teach me how to pronounce it. Uh, he also got a master's degree from Wayne State University and a PhD from Michigan State University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Clear. He's the senior uh, research uh, uh, economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. <coughs> And, and it's always a pleasure to have Tom back, and he's one of the uh, best economists in uh, the auto industry. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Siva. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here on this uh, uh, wintry-like fall uh, morning in Chicago. Um, and uh, uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Siva. Oh, thank now, you. <laughs> you, you asked me to talk on the topic, is the auto industry under siege? Well, I don't know what to say. Uh, uh, maybe you should go into the forecasting business, Siva. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's uh, move to the next slide, and that just gives you a, uh, a sample of, of uh, the last two weeks out of the industry press. And uh, I think that sort of says it, and everybody in the room, I think, knows it too. Uh, these are interesting times in the auto industry. You can't pick up the newspaper uh, without finding another story on uh, the latest development. So I figured, I, instead of ending my talk right here and just answering the question with yes, uh, I'm going to take a step back and uh, look at the developments that we're currently facing uh, in the industry um, with, with, with the question in mind of what is, what, is, uh, what is going on here, what can we look at, what we can, can we tell from the reading the signs um, by stepping back and putting it sort of in a more longer term perspective. And I'm also going to focus on North America uh, sort of to, to uh, complement the uh, uh, discussion information we're receiving on uh, Japan and, and China today as well. So, um, so the first point I want to make is that um, the cycle is back in this industry. To the next slide, please. Um, one more. It's uh, it's hard to believe, but uh, the motor vehicle production actually is a cyclical industry. Um, it's the second most important, uh, second most expensive item households purchase next to homes. And guess what? When uh, when things get iffy and things get tough, people defer the purchase of a new vehicle. And um, everybody in, in, uh, in the regions on the, around the world that are tied to automotive, they know about this. But if you look at this chart, it shows you the, uh, this is light vehicle sales, that uh, we shrugged off the recession in 2001 from the perspective of the auto sector. There was hardly a, a breather that uh, this industry took. We breezed right through it. We had uh, 10 plus years of unprecedented uh, light vehicle sales rates, and um, and that's why what's going on right now looks so different. Even though it's something that everybody in this industry is familiar with, when things are going really well in the economy, they're going particularly well in auto. And when things are not going well in the economy in general, they're going worse in the auto sector because it's more cyclical than the rest of the economy. Um, and and uh, the business cycle is back with a vengeance. Uh, light vehicle sales rates have been dropping like a rock. And we're back to where we were in the early 90s, even though we're not anywhere near uh, where we were in the uh, 79 and uh, early 80 recession, as you can see in this chart. So what's, what's driving the current slowdown? It all started with gasoline prices rising. One of the earlier speakers talked about that. And uh, the fast increase forced the shift in the consumer public to smaller vehicles. And then more recently, uh, gasoline prices have sort of become the background story. It's the, uh, the tighter credit markets and the uh, inability to uh, finance vehicles with the resulting drop in the uh, consumer confidence that have um, uh, slowed down things considerably. And this chart shows you how the uh, consumer confidence in light vehicle sales uh, in the U.S. have been moving south in lockstep um, as of late. In this development, you know, while one could argue, okay, so uh, as gasoline prices rise, the vehicle manufacturers that have, um, have on offer uh, a, a, a product mix of uh, more fuel efficient and smaller vehicles tend to be relatively better off. What's currently going on seems to be hitting everybody in the same way. Uh, this is the most recent uh, uh, light vehicle sales data from uh, September of this year, and the, the 
uh, change here is listing the year-over-year -year change from September 07 to September 08, and I can't see a pattern here. Everybody has uh, double-digit negative uh, growth rates from a year ago. So to put this in perspective, this business cycle uh, development, let's take a step back and uh, talk about what has been characterizing this industry for more than a decade, what I call structural changes. Now, on this slide, I show you the, uh, the level of employment, and I break it out, uh, light vehicle uh, production in parts. That's the blue line, and then the blue scale on the right-hand side. And uh, assembly employment, that's the red line, and the, the scale that accompanies the red line is on the left-hand side. And what you can clearly see is that employment in the U.S. auto industry has been declining uh, for quite some time now. It started well before this business cycle hit the industry at the beginning of the year. So there's something else going on that's driving this industry, and it's continuing to drive this industry, and it's possibly going to continue to drive this industry once we come out of this cycle. And that's why I think it's important to take this step back and take a bit of a longer view on, uh, on, on the forces on, that are shaping this industry structurally. So there's this conflict between cyclical and structural change. As you can see, the, uh, the parts employment peak in uh, uh, 2000, right as um, light vehicle production was peaking in the country. And assembly employment actually peaked much earlier in the mid-90s. Um, you see this, this period of from mid-90s to the early 21st century of slow, slow and steady decline. During that time period, during those five or six years, there actually was not a single new assembly plant open in this country. Um, and you can characterize this as productivity improvements. And then as, as production started dropping off, um, you have employment declining almost lock, in lockstep with, uh, with the parts employment. So you put it all together, since the year 2000 employment in light vehicle production, that's assembly and parts in this country is down by just over 30 percent. That's not a trivial change. So what's driving the structural change? There are three points I'd like to make. The internationalization of uh, uh, vehicle and parts production and sales, uh, the greater role of the supply base, and the changing industry geography. Herbie led the way. Um, the motor vehicle industry has changed quite dramatically. Internationalization became first apparent by foreign producers offering their products here in the U.S. and the North American market, and VW started the way um, in the late 60s and early 70s. And then uh, VW was followed uh, by the Japanese producers who uh, took the uh, uh, page out of the playbook of VW and improved on their strategy and offered uh, models that were matching the demand uh, for smaller products at the time. Uh, in the mid-70s, we had two oil shocks, and, uh, and things moved on from there. And you can see in this little table here, the import share um, in the U.S. market has been increasing steadily and sort of st uh, leveled out, uh, peaked in the 80s with just under 25 percent. Now, this is about sales. I have a chart here about production as well. 1978, VW came to this country to produce vehicles in a plant in Westmoreland. Um, that plant was shut down 10 years later, but they're coming back uh, to uh, a different state. They're coming back to Tennessee, where they're uh, getting ready to build an assembly plant that is, I believe, scheduled to open in 2011. But from 1980 to uh, the current time period, we went from four vehicle producers to 13. You may wonder, what's the fourth one? There was AMC that was still around in 1980. Uh, and now we have 13, including VW, which is coming back after an absence. That's a pretty dramatic change uh, on the home turf of the North, North American auto industry. And interestingly enough, the arrival sort of followed um, the uh, country of origin. The Japanese producers all happened to start producing in the 80s. Uh, the Germans, with the exception of VW, uh, BMW and Mercedes arrived in the 90s, and the Korean producers arrived uh, most recently. The, uh, the flip side of this, of this in globalization, internationalization of the industry at home is that the traditional domestic producers lost part of the market. Now, this is a, a chart that covers a, lo a lot of ground. It goes back all the way to 1960, and that, that links back to this uh, uh, 
factoid of the uh, Beetle being the first major imported vehicle that started uh, being started that entered the market right around that time. The point I want to make, though, and that links this chart back to the uh, job losses in the industry uh, that I pointed out uh, a few slides ago, is if you look at this market share decline, it um, it stabilized uh, in the early 80s. There's a decade where it's essentially flat from the early 80s to the mid 90s, and after that, it accelerates. Um, and uh, it continues sort of unabated. And that links in back to the structural change that I've pointed out earlier. Next slide, please. So we went from the, from the big three to the big six, and the order varies depending on how um, sort of a time frame we lay on this. If you just look at the last monthly sales rates, Chrysler actually dropped in the sixth position. So it goes GM, Toyota, Ford, Honda, Chrysler, and Nissan. At the same time, the supply base has become much more international as well. Automotive News, uh, the leading industry weekly, started putting out a list uh, in the year 1994, the 150 largest automotive parts suppliers based on North American revenue. And, when you, and the most recent list they published covers the year 2007. It came out just a couple of months ago. So you can do what you can do is you can go in there and you can uh, you can group the companies that are reported in the list by where their ultimate headquarters is. And then that's what I've done, and put it in this table. And you see how dramatically the nature of the parts industry has changed as well over this time period. We had um, two-thirds of the large parts suppliers were US-based just in 1994. That's gone down to 60 out of 150. Now you gotta keep in mind that that list has sort of the issue that the Fortune 500 list has as well. That is to say, just because you're dropping out of this list doesn't mean you don't go, you're not necessarily going out of business. You're just not making the cut. If your revenue drops below the you know, rank 150, uh, you're still around. So, it's, so if you're not in this list anymore, it doesn't necessarily mean you've gone away. The European uh, part suppliers uh, that are present in North America doubled in number, and the Asian part suppliers tripled. So even at your home turf, if you're in the parts business, uh, the industry has changed quite dramatically. At the same time, the structure of the industry has changed, and we're going to hear a lot more about this uh, uh, probably following the break, where we have a, a great supplier panel coming up um, uh, on the program. <coughs> In the olden days, uh, you know, we talked about uh, the history of Ford Motor Company. Uh, when Henry Ford was around, he wanted to control the entire supply chain. Uh, he had lumber operations in the UP, rubber plantations in Central America. You know, if you go to the Rouge um, assembly plant to River Rouge, there's a steel plant right next door. That's still there. That's now owned by a Russian steel company. But the whole supply chain, he wanted to be within his corporate empire because control was the big issue. He didn't want to be surprised by something not being delivered uh, and not being available. Well, that, that whole part of the industry has changed rather dramatically. Outsourcing is the nature of the game and has been uh, for a couple of decades now. And when you look uh, where the jobs and the value added, how they are distributed, you have one, um, for every assembly job, there are now four jobs in, um, in the parts sector, and over 70% of the, of the value added of the vehicle comes from outside the corporate structure of the assembly companies. And that's a structural change as well. Uh, I'm just going to scrape sort of the, uh, the surface of this supplier industry business. If you'd like to know more about this, this is my commercial here. Uh, Jim Rubenstein and I, we came up with a book on the auto, indus auto supplier industry, which has the catchy title, The Really Made Your Car, um, where we talk about this in great detail. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. So the next few minutes, I'm going to show you some maps about um, the... Uh, in North American auto industry. <coughs> this is, the, if, if you will, the equivalent of the satellite view where uh, the black stars represent the uh, assembly locations where light vehicles are being produced. Medium and heavy-duty trucks are not in here. And then the, uh, in the background, the, the orange color is the supply base. There are over 4,500 individual plants that make up this map. Um, you can see how concentrated this industry is. You can see that it's integrated across borders. Uh, it, you'd be hard-pressed to find the border between uh, the U.S. and Canada on this map 
historically, this industry has always been uh, heavily integrated across that in international border. And you also see that uh, there's a uh, sizable part of this industry in the interior of Mexico. And then you see some big dots around the border between, the Me between Mexico and, and the U.S. Those are the Macaladora plants that are technically inside, just within a certain distance of the border, inside of Mexico. But the production from there goes into U.S. and it's not considered to be an import. So you have, you know, this is a, the, the map is drawn at the zip code level of detail, so you have a large number of plants at uh, three or four locations along the U.S.-Mexico border. So the industry is concentrated. And when you look a little bit more closely, you can clearly see what we call auto alley or auto corridor, where interstate highway transportation is front and center when it comes to locating uh, business activities in this industry. I-65 and I-75 define they are the spines of this auto alley in the north-south dimension. But then you can also think of this as a, as a ladder where the east-west interstates work right, like rungs. Um, Dennis Cuneo is here. Uh, so we have, um, you take uh, Toyota's example, for example. For, yeah, I-64 features prominently in Toyota's supply chain. Lexington, Kentucky is the mother plant of Toyota's North American operations. Uh, Princeton, Indiana, uh, in the southwest corner of Indiana. And then there's an engine plant in uh, Buffalo, West Virginia. So you can, you can move your trucks east-west on the same interstate, uh, and you're not moving out of the uh, out of alley alley. And this applies to uh, at, at all the different levels anyway. So this is, this is the close-up view. This is the auto corridor or auto alley. And you, you see the importance of transportation. You see the importance of co-location. If you're in the supplier business, the nature of the game is, uh, with few exceptions, you like to be in a spot where you can deliver to multiple assembly plants, uh, most likely representing different companies from one location. You don't want to dedicate your, your business um, to one particular customer. And being concentrated like that allows you to do this. Now, when you take this auto region and you, you slice it uh, by the dimension of who is assembling vehicles in what location, that is to say, which of these assembly companies are North American, which ones are foreign, you find some interesting uh, distinction. Uh, instead of giving the, the, uh, the exact symbols, I use something that economists call a, a density measure that shows up better on maps, but it, it, it has the same the underlying principle. It measures the density of assembly line operations. And on the left-hand side panel of this slide, you see where the Detroit Three Companies assembly operations are currently located with a forward-looking perspective. I call this 2008 plus because this map incorporates all announced plant closures, so Twin Cities, for example, in Janesville, Wisconsin, which are slated to close, I've already taken them out. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, I've taken that out because it's going to happen. By the same token, I've already added all the plans. They're not, they're not operational yet, but they're under construction. So Toyota, Mississippi is already in there on the right-hand side panel, and the VW plant going to Chattanooga is in there as well. And what's interesting to me about this is that there is some overlap, but they are also they are also quite different from one another. And this 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 difference in geography of the industry with a shifting market share um, has been an ongoing structural change that's affecting the location and fortunes of uh, the supply base in this industry. And let's focus on the suppliers a little more. When you take these uh, plant records and you put them on a map, here's how they cluster. Auto alley matters to the supply base. Um, at least as much as to the assemblers. And I can do a similar exercise for the, uh, for the supply base then. Uh, I can ask the data which of these plants is part of a company whose headquarters are in North America, and then I'm going to color them in green and call them domestic, and uh, which, which of the supply, supply of motor vehicle parts plants uh, are part of companies where the ultimate headquarters is outside of North America. And I'm going to color them in what looks like purple here. And you see that there is a north-south separation, uh, which of course makes sense because uh, foreign suppliers tended to come to this country primarily serving the assembly companies that they followed and then started expanding their business from then. But you still see this geographic separation um, in the locations. And the final map I'm showing you here, um, when you put this all together and you look at this auto industry and its geography in this country, 
and the importance of supply chains and just-in-time delivery, what the database allows me to do, it allows me to link individual suppliers and their assembly customers. And I've done this here for the example of Toyota. Uh, the center of these circles is the Georgetown plant in, in Kentucky. And then uh, when, when, you, when you draw, what I do is I, I envelope each of the 25 closest percent of the, uh, of the supply base by distance to Kentucky. And then the, the outermost circle envelopes 75 percent of Toyota's supply base, and they're only 485 miles away uh, from, uh, from Georgetown. That is a state-of-the-art uh, supply network where you can, you can be within a, driving, a day's driving distance where in the industry the rule of thumb is about uh, 450 to 500 miles. Unless you have to go through Chicago, then it's at least 50 miles less um, because everybody gets stuck on I-94. Um, you can cover that much ground in a day, and if you can envelope three quarters of your supply base, um, things are looking pretty good. Also note that the Toyota assembly plant uh, happens to be almost halfway in terms of the north-south extension of Auto Alley. Supplier networks are regional. They're regional animals. They're regional in nature. And that's what this picture is supposed to illustrate you. All right. Now, I started talking about the industry cycle. And I, went, I, I took a detour and I talked about structural changes, um, and now I'm trying to bring it back up to the current uh, situation by looking ahead. What are, the, what are the challenges that this industry is facing that we know are going to be around uh, once this cycle uh, blows over? Well, we know that the uh, CAFE regulations have been tightened. That's already become law. Uh, it's almost a year ago when the energy bill was passed. Um, we're going up by 2020 uh, to the uh, a new average of 35 miles per gallon. We are still working on the details and, and, and uh, writing the final uh, rules in terms of exactly how this is being measured, um, and we're, we're anxiously awaiting that. Second point is what's going to happen to the price of gasoline. Data can only look backwards, and what we see here is that we had this uh, long-lasting and uh, fast-paced increase over five years that peaked just about two months ago. And now as we drive wherever we go, we see every day the price of gasoline is falling. So the big question going forward, of course, is what's going to happen? Where's the price of gasoline going to be two or five years from now? Will it be hovering around $3? Is it going to go down below 2 uh, These things matter immensely if you're in the business of selling and uh, designing vehicles where you have lead times of up to four years, uh, committing large amounts of capital and trying to come up with a mix of products that consumers demand four years down the road. Um, will small, remain, small vehicles remain as attractive as they are today, where the Prius outsells the Ford Explorer and the Mini Cooper outsells the Hummer H3 uh, by noticeable margins? To summarize, we have the business cycle uh, hitting this industry right now very hard. Uh, housing weakness and credit issues are affecting uh, everybody in this industry heart suppliers, and car makers as well. But let's not forget that there are structural um, uh, trends going on in this industry uh, that, as far as we can tell, um, are currently just being put on the back burner. There are regional effects of changes in this industry that have been particularly felt in the state of Michigan, which has almost lost half the jobs of the, uh, of the industry since the year 2000. Um, and we have to be aware of these possibilities of structural changes in demand because of uh, uh, rising fuel prices, and we know for sure that the increase in the CAFE standards has to be met uh, one way or the other, and there's people that argue the low-hanging fruit has already been picked when the first set of CAFE rules was introduced. Uh, these are very dynamic and turbulent times. We have all kinds of things that are being tried on the powertrain side, ranging from hybrid vehicles um, to ultra-low emission uh, internal combustion engines, um, to fuel cell vehicles. So at this point, it's anybody's game. Um, these are interesting times, and we'll have to see which way the industries are going. But these challenges are not going away. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for such an in-depth analysis. Uh, Tom, uh, please stay on for a couple of minutes. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Again, thank you for the presentation. Um, and we have a microphone there. If possible, uh, I would be appreciative if you can use the microphone. Yes. 
Let me adjust the microphone here a bit. Yeah, I'm not very sensitive. No, okay. Ah, this. All right. Thank you. Okay, let me. And does it better? Yes, thank you for the presentation. You're uh, welcome. You, you indicated that there, is a, there has been, and rightly so, a move uh, for more and more value added by the suppliers and the auto industry, per se, uh, at least the, the three in Detroit, mm -hmm. moving uh, more towards just assembly plants. Uh, we've seen another move recently, uh, for instance, the uh, Jeep Wrangler plant in Toledo, and uh, some uh, uh, previous experiments by Ford to uh, uh, do what they call the pot plant, pan production, where the suppliers, for instance, the uh, Jeep there, the Magnus Sayer, uh, actually uh, build a plant, run a plant, and uh, uh, they pay so much out the door for vehicle production. Do you see any move in that direction with the auto industry to become just like the uh, you, you raise an interesting point. Uh, I, you know, the Toledo experiment, uh, I think, is, is uh, not been copied by anybody else at this point. There are um, operations elsewhere, assembly operations elsewhere in the world uh, that move closer to that. I think in Brazil it was uh, where, I think it was GM first tried the rolling chassis approach where Dana uh, was responsible for, uh, for managing the assembly operation up to that point and you had a significant number of non-GM employees on the floor of the assembly plant. Uh, in, in the U.S., these efforts haven't, taken, gone, haven't gone beyond what, uh, what uh, um, Chrysler has tried in, in Toledo. Um, my understanding is that it's working well, even though they had some hiccups originally, because I think they ended up going through two um, paint suppliers before they ended up finding one that, they en that ended up being able to deliver um, uh, in this particular plant. So, of course, that, that changes the nature of the game. I mean, you're out of your comfort zone in a certain way if, because you're not just, you're not just uh, uh, um, absolved. I mean, you, you, you're also handing a large responsibility over to the supplier who's in charge of this particular program. So these things have to be worked out. Um, but, but that's sort of where the uh, – um, that's an extreme case. I don't see this one as becoming the norm. Uh, in North America, at least. I think that was the gist of your question. Um, and there have been, for example, on the interior side, uh, there was this noticeable pullback of the uh, OEMs here in North America, where two to three years ago they started pulling back uh, a fair amount of this, of handing over the R&D and uh, responsibility to the, uh, the suppliers. And there were only two or three left, like Lear and Johnson Controls bringing it back in-house. They started feeling, we've given away too much. Um, we, w we want to retain more control uh, internally. So these things are fluid. They're evolving. And it's sort of fascinating to see how, how these changes have played out for the different systems. I guess interior, it's gone the furthest where the supply base is cons consolidated up um, the, the sharpest in terms of the tier structure, where at the top, there are only two or three large tier one companies left. Thinking was too, and another is we all know these these uh, cycles are very painful in terms of cash flow. And if they uh, if someone else were running the operation, uh, would it be less painful, uh, like the Jeep Toledo? Well, if you're if the volume if the sales volume slows down, uh, and you have cash flow issues, that should feed down all the way to the supply chain. I I mean the way I read the situation is there's little difference between. Uh, this, the pain and the slowdown being felt by GM and Toyota uh, due to the cycle, not due to the structural changes, due to the cycle, than there is by, uh, by the supply base. For every vehicle that GM produces less and Toyota produces less, there is the equivalent of, in parts that are being produced, are not being produced and delivered by the supply base, and the, the absence of the cash flow feeds right through. Okay. Um, and I would be grateful if you can uh, mention your name and your company so that uh, give us more opportunity to do networking. I'm Hank Martinson with Atlantic 209 in Ohio. Uh, one thing you didn't talk very much about was you know, we've got an overcapacity in the industry, and that's what we're all dealing with. And what effect might the Chinese play on importing vehicles here and change that dynamics in the marketplace? Okay. Um, so one thing that's been true about motor vehicle assembly in North America, going all the way back to the days of Henry Ford, 
is that vehicles tend to be assembled near the, near the, where they're being used. In other words, the, the, uh, the Chinese producers, if they want to enter this market, once their operations get large enough, I would think they will follow the playbook of the Germans and of the Koreans and the Japanese, that at some point you start producing here because it doesn't pay to ship vehicles across the ocean unless you're in a niche product. Um, if you're making a vehicle that you can fill an assembly plant with, you will put that here. Uh, and you find that in the major markets around the world. You find that in Europe, and you find that in Asia, and you find that in North America. Vehicles are being produced near where they're being sold. Uh, and that's been true basically from day one of this industry. Now, for the parts side, it's a different story. And there's an, industry, there's an interesting equivalent to that, actually, that affected the geography of this production within this country. Um, when, when the market for vehicles took off in Henry Ford's days in the 20s and 30s, um, they faced the problem of having to build multiple assembly plants. And the question was, where are we going to put them? There wasn't an auto alley around at this point. Nobody talked about the auto corridor. Um, and the question they faced is, are we going to put them all in the Midwest or not? Um, if they would have put them all in the Midwest, they would have had to ship the product to wherever the demand is, which happened to be all across the country. So what they decided to do is they, they – uh, I forget the name of the guy, but in, uh, one of Henry, Henry Ford's uh, uh, administrators was responsible for the supply chain. And they figured out that it's a lot more effective to load parts into train cars because you don't transport as much air as if you, you put a finished vehicle in there. So they decided to build assembly branch plants all near the centers of demand. So they went to the coasts. The legacy of these plants just started uh, disappearing uh, in the early 80s, and they're almost exclusively all gone. There's one plant left on the East Coast, and there's one plant left on the West Coast. There used to be about a dozen on uh, both coasts in the 50s and 60s. So what they ended up doing is they built assembly plants near the centers of demand. The parts industry stayed in the Midwest, and the parts were shipped to these assembly plants. That's an example at a national scale to illustrate my point that um, uh, I, I'm pretty confident to say that motor vehicle assembly is in, not going to leave this country uh, in, in major chunks. When you go to the parts side, though, it's a different story. And uh, I didn't bring the slides, but you can go back and look at the, the history of uh, uh, where motor vehicle parts are coming from and the level of motor vehicle parts uh, to the U.S. And that has been on a steady upward trend over at least 15 to 20 years. Uh, and they're coming from all over the world, mm, depending on what, what type of system you're looking at and, and what kind of parts. Um, I mean, some of these supply chains, they reach all the way to Singapore, you know, and it's small electronic parts. You put them on an airplane, it's small, small weight uh, and high value. So, um, so if, as foreign producers come to this region, um, what's happened in the past, and I think what's going to continue to happen, is if their volume increases, they will start producing here. Um, and do we have any questions on the floor? Uh, let me ask you, Tom, um, Watson is the uh, brilliant. They recently signed a deal with the uh, owner of Houston Rock to sell the distribution in America. And you think that that is in, in implying the Chinese vehicle would be imported to America pretty soon? Well, there are Chinese vehicles that are being imported to uh, Europe. Um, and uh, I think there have been Chinese vehicles exhibited at the Detroit Auto Show in the last two years, I, I believe, seeing them there. This, you know, it takes a certain amount of time to find the product, to get it right, to, uh, to meet the, uh, the, uh, the uh, say, to, to meet the standards, right, the regulatory standards, and then to hit, to hit uh, the, either the right price point or the right design point of the vehicle so that it'll be a success in the market. And um, I... I mean, I, for me, it's just a, qu a question of time, I think. I think it's going to happen. I don't know who the first producer will be who will get that right, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we'll see that um, within less than 10 years, probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And thank you very much. Do we have any other questions on the floor? If not, and, uh, I would like to thank the Tom for such a wonderful presentation. Um, we have a token of appreciation and to uh, thank Tom for making Thanks, such David. a wonderful presentation. Thank and we uh, hope that and he will come back for some other event in the future. Right, and thank you very much. Thank you.
we are going to take a break and we are coming back at uh, let me look. We are coming back at 9:45. So, would give us about uh, and why don't 